it's always interesting when I don't feel this. How I go through this litany of trying to figure out what it is that's going on because when you're when you have been previously disabled and you have a potential for an incurable disease to raise its head and attack you and afflict you. As most people that have serious illnesses or life-threatening diseases understand, you have in your mind always compartmentalized this kind of like mental checklist you go through to make sure that you're either doing the right things that you're supposed to be doing and then is this like a physical affliction or is it a emotional affliction? Is it a spiritual affliction? Well, you know, what's going on? You know, why do you feel the, you know, or why do you feel oppressed or whatever it may be? And God doesn't always come through immediately and tell you exactly what's going on. So you trust in the Lord with all your heart. You don't lean in your own understanding and all your ways you acknowledge him and you go forward, letting him direct your path so that though you may not feel or look to others like you're a hundred percent, you just trust that the Lord takes care of the rest. Keith Green had one of the best things that I've ever heard. He just said, do your best and pray that it's blessed and Jesus takes care of the rest. So you don't worry about it. So, in not worrying about it, under the same light, praying in, excuse me, praying in the Holy Ghost. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have access by one spirit unto the Father. O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. The spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we might, or as we ought to. But the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, and he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I always hear so often these wonderful prayers that are offered, and people have said that I pray beautifully in some prayer meetings. I see prayer chains, and I see prayer vigils, and prayer watches, and praying in tongues, and all these other things. And You know, sometimes I would like to grab some people sometimes when they get carried away in those things to remind them that, hey look, no matter what you prayed or what you said, the Holy Spirit is reinterpreting it anyways. Then he tells Jesus and Jesus tells the Father. So it's kind of like, you know, it isn't that important the words that you're saying so much as it is that what you're praying at times will be more for your benefit than it is for God's because he already knows. So... In some ways, you know, I understand why people have to make these prayer chains, you know, because they just can't seem to get it through their head that you can pray every day and say the same thing, you know, and without having to tell everyone about it. And prayer chains are more, for conversation pieces, they're more like, to me, prayer chains are, are uh, prayer chains are gossip pains, you know, they're just waiting for someone to get hurt, you know, and that just, I don't understand them. I never have, you know, I've never seen them in scripture, I wasn't a part of them. When we used to get prayer requests, I used to be in the men's prayer watch, which was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And uh, whether you know it or not, at night, you know, there are men that stood by night in the house of the Lord and prayed for the ministry, you know, to be successful and prayed for the needs of the people that were presented to the church office. And they would coordinate taking in all that people said. And then kind of filtering it down to where it'd be like Jane, Salvation, David, Healing, George, Job, you know, things like that. And what we would do is that as men of God, we would sit there and we would pray, at least two of us, you know, maybe more at times. And we would receive the prayer request and then we would pray specifically as the Holy Spirit led us, as we felt inspired to pray. You know, if there was uh, a lot of prayers, you know, during our shift, we would pray as many as we could, and the next shift would take over. And we usually had, I think it was, it was either a three-hour or four-hour shift, and it was nonstop. We just prayed and prayed and prayed. And it was wonderful. I had a, it was a blessing. I mean, it was, it was one of the most intimate times there. In it was a very real time. That's all I could say. But even those types of prayer requests were never specific 
they were generic in the sense of allowing the person who's praying to be specific in their own heart. You know, and we agreed with whatever the person had already been intended to say it in the first place. So, for us, it was kind of like, you know, word of knowledge, word of wisdom would give us the inspiration to pray according to what we felt praying. You know, I, I remember one time, you know, thinking that, you know, I was going to get killed because I was a, I think they made me a deacon that time. I'm not sure. I get made into so many things that people give me these titles and I technically reject them. But the church, whatever church I'm going to at the time, makes me into it and then they treat me like that. And I kind of go, don't call me it. Just, if that's what you want to put me in that office, fine. So someone came up to me and wanted prayer and, you know, they started going into this long explanation. And I, I kind of listened and as I was listening, the Lord told me, Michael, you can't pray for that. <laughs> I was like, Lord, you can't tell me that. <laughs> I was thinking, I ain't no way, Lord. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. You know, and lo and behold, sure enough, about the time that the woman got done, you know, I, I was very caring and very <laughs> nervous. But I looked the woman in the eye, you know, and... She, you know, she had, I'd been holding her hands, you know, in front of her, you know, because she had come to me for prayer. And I said, you know, man, I said, as you were talking, the Lord spoke to me and said, I can't pray for that. And I said, I don't really know what to do now, you know, except to tell you that the Lord told me I can't pray for that. And the weirdest thing happened, kind of like a glow came over her face. And she looked at me and she said, I knew that. And then she blessed me and walked away. And I thought, that was weird. Have you ever been in that position where sometimes you couldn't pray for what people asked you to pray for? Now, it's happened to me more often. You know, there are different times and different situations where I have prayed according to wisdom, meaning that God has given me a way to pray for something in a different than what the request was. And sometimes the person has thanked me for, you know, doing that. Sometimes they, you know, I don't know what they thought. <laughs> I'm not sure. But if we know that the Holy Spirit is interpreting our prayers anyways, it's not so important that we agree necessarily. But if you don't agree, then you should not pray. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't just offer up these, you know, vain repetitions or things that you think that should be done or would be done or could be done just because you think it ought to be done. But rather be real with your God and let him lead you in prayer as the Holy Spirit interprets for us how we ought to pray. This is the confidence, let's see, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. This is the confidence that we have to him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide us into all truth. Praying, therefore, always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and patience. There is a hope of a tree if it be cut down that it will spread again. Whoa, got the wrong glasses on for doing this, but that's okay. We'll just read it anyways. There is a hope of a tree if it be cut down that it will sprout again and that the leading and that the leader branch thereof will not cease. That's an interesting scripture. It's from Job 14.7. A bruised reed shall he not break, he restoreth my soul. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness, unto them which are exercised thereby. In feeling down, sometimes you, you react to that same spirit of feeling, maybe, Lord, you, you're telling me something, you know, and you ask God if you're being chastened because you don't want to negate the sorrow that you feel if you have sinned, you know, and you confessed your sin to the Father and he's forgiven you and you know that he has but likewise you still go through feelings in the sense of God doesn't take away the 
consequence of the actions that have been performed. Well, you could pray that, and you know, personally, me, I don't, you know, I ask forgiveness, but I pray more so <laughs> and ask that God would remove the consequences of my actions and the stupidity of my my sinfulness that I would not have to suffer through the consequences of the things that I have done, that he would remove them as far as he says from the west and cast them into a sea, you know, where it no longer would be remembered, that that way I would not have to go through what I know that I'm probably going to go through anyways, which is the consequences of the actions that I've done that led me into sin or caused me to sin or that the sin that I have committed. Now, I'm kind of long-winded that way because I think that, hey, you know what, the consequences, sin is fun, but the consequences are a real problem. <laughs> so I always pray about the consequences. But anyways, in that respect, then, we know that godly sorrow must work repentance because the idea of repenting is one thing. That just means to turn around, but repentance in theological terms always involves a lot more of what Christians want to tell you, that you have to feel remorse and sorrow and bad and feel like you really let the Lord down and guilt and shame and all these other things in order to be really repentant, you know. And personally, I think that it's a lot wiser to say, hey, you know what, I'd rather be in the right direction, you know, and work on it as I'm going, than to just keep going and being remorseful and never go closer to God. So sometimes there's a balance between the two. You know, you need to know which way you got to go in order to get right, so that way you've got it right, and next time that it happens, you probably won't do wrong, but you'll do right. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou art God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such a deliverance as this. In other words, God could literally wipe you out any minute of any day at any time in any way that he chooses to. He could. It would still meet his justice, it would still meet his criteria of love, it would still meet his mercy, it would still meet his compassion. It would still meet all these things that people say, oh, God can't do because God is this or God is that, and God won't this and God won't that, and God won't this and God is that. No, God is God, and he is that he is, and he is. I mean, that's the way it is. Sorry. We're created by him, so we don't really have a whole lot of argumentation to offer up if God decided to do whatever he wanted to do, because he is sovereign. That eliminates any theological debate, period. Sorry, can't go there. You're wrong. <laughs> That's all there is to it. The sovereignty of God rules out all other exceptions and quote-unquote perspectives that mankind offers up in some kind of theological ideas that they try to attach to the scriptures in order to supposedly understand them better, but really what they're trying to do is put them in a box. Whenever you try to put God in a box, he's going to operate outside of it every time. So don't try to define God. Let God be God and let you be created being that you are. You'll find it worked out a whole lot better. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. He will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. It's like when you see the righteousness of God, you have no fear for what you would do because you know that the closer you are and how near he is, the less you feel like you are worthy of being in his presence and the less that you demand your own righteousness or your own holiness and you recognize what a sinful, mindful creature you are, even as John did when he was in heaven and knew that he was a man undone. And the same will be true of you. You will have no pride once you step out of this body into the existence of where God is. All will be laid bare before him, and we will not have anything except to fall at the mercy and the justice and the forgiveness and the grace and the kindness and the long-suffering of our Lord and our Master, as well as the judgment of God. In that respect, when we do step out of what we live in today, all our pride will flee away as though it were vapors of what it really is, which is just hot air and wind. And it won't mean anything at all to think that we have the righteousness of Christ, for we will feel as though we are in the, in the presence of the Almighty God himself. 